will give thanks unto the Lord for he is good. This is Sister Sharon and welcome to Mass Memorial CME Sunday School for November 6, 2022. We're on our fall quarter, A Living Faith. We are in unit three now. What does faith cost? What does faith cost? Today's lesson, Paul before King Agrippa, the key verse, but he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. Acts the 26th chapter, the 25th, 25th verse. And our lesson scripture is Acts the 26th chapter, verses 19 through 32. Now, in order to do this lesson, everyone, and this will actually set us up for the rest of the lessons in the quarter, I have to give a lot, a lot of history, okay? But it's also interesting because this history, it almost look, seems like a soap opera, but this is truth. And so, but we need this history in order to, to get into Paul being in front of King Agrippa. So first, just because we're in the book of Acts and we have been in the book of Acts, but it says from the New Schofield Study Bible, it says, this book is of highest importance because it's the only inspired account of the beginning and early work of the church. It is the primary textbook for the study of missionary principles, the defense of the faith, the person and work of the Holy Spirit, and the methods and themes of Christian preaching. So today we have a lot of characters. So I call it the cast of characters. So, and I've gotten a lot of this information about Felix Festus and King Agrippa II from gotquestions.org. So we're gonna be introduced to Felix today. And Antonius Felix was formerly a slave, but was promoted by Claudius Caesar to the officer, to the office of governor, okay? And this is governor um, in Judea, okay? Felix was described as cruel, licentious, and base. While in Judea, Felix was attracted to Drusilla, a daughter of Herod Agrippa I. The fact that a Drusilla, who was sister to King Agrippa II and Bernice, and this will all come together, was already married, made no difference to Felix. He enticed her away from her husband, and they later married. Okay, so he was promoted by Claudius Caesar to the governor, to the office of governor. Felix was the governor of Judea and Samaria when the apostle Paul was arrested in Jerusalem for preaching the gospel. Because a mob was planning to kill Paul before he could come to trial, the Roman commander hustled Paul away in the night, accompanied by 200 soldiers to Caesarea so that his case could be heard by Governor Felix. So that's Acts the 23rd chapter, okay? So then we also are introduced to the seceding um, governor of Judea named Festus. And Portius Festus was a Roman purator or governor who seceded Antonius Felix somewhere between 80, 55, and 60. History describes him as fair and reasonable, much more so than Felix. In the Bible, Portius Festus is known for sending Paul to Rome to stand trial under Emperor Nero. Okay, so that's Festus. We're also going to talk about King Agrippa II. Now, he's one of these Herods, and I'm going to run through the Herods um, because we know a lot of these Herods from um, Bible history. So the Herods were Idumeans, um, descendants of Esau, backed by the Roman authority, were in control of Palestine during the time of Jesus' birth, and the founding of the church. So there was um, Antipater, or Antipater, he, was, he used Roman control to leverage Jewish civil unrest, and he died of poisoning. There was Herod the Great, which we know well, okay? He proclaimed, he was proclaimed king of the Jews by the Romans. He exterminated his enemies, including one wife and two to three sons. So he had 10 wives and 15 sons. And he's the one that committed, in, in, emphasize trying to kill baby Jesus. So remember, he killed all the um, baby, the boys that were two years and, and lower trying to kill Jesus because he didn't want anybody to come up against him as king because remember, Jesus was going to be king. Then there was Herod Archelaus, worst reputation. He married his half brother's widow. Told you this is soap opera stuff. Then there is Herod Antipas. He divorced his first wife to marry his half brother's 
wife and also his niece Bernice okay and we're gonna talk about Bernice more now we also know him because he's the one where John the Baptist told him that he was in sin that he was he was not to be married to his half brother's wife okay and he's the one that ended up having John the Baptist beheaded then there's Herod Philip II he was the just one <laughs> best thing to say when you're dealing with this family then there was Herod Agrippa the first he's the one that imprisoned Peter and had James the brother of John executed and we can find that in Acts the 12th chapter okay and then he was struck down by God for his arrogance because he just declared himself basically God and God just struck him down and then for today's lesson we are on Herod Agrippa the second okay and he had an incestuous relationship with his half-sister, Bernice. Okay, so if you go through this again, okay, and I say, yes, the same Bernice. So um, if, you, if you go back through this, going back just for a minute to keep track of things, okay, um, they had a sister, Drusilla. Okay, she was married to Felix. Okay, and so... The, the, so in-laws okay so Drusilla was married to Felix who was a, the governor of Judea at one time and then um her brother was King Agrippa II and her sister were Bernice okay and then Bernice ends up married basically to her uncle okay who was Herod Antipas you see that okay and then she ends up um, in a relationship with her brother, okay, and so, as I said, so proper, but these are the people involved, and sometimes you need to know about their character or what's going on with them in order to understand where this lesson comes from, so now we're talking about Paul, so Paul, his Hebrew name was Saul, his Hebrew name was Saul, um, his Roman name was Paul, okay, he was Jewish, but born a Roman citizen. And he was born a Roman citizen. He didn't buy citizenship. You could buy citizenship, but he was born a Roman citizen. He was born at Tarsus in Cilicia. He was a tent maker by trade. He also was a Pharisee and a member of the Jewish Sanhedrin when all this stuff, when he was basically called by Jesus. Okay. He ended up becoming an apostle to the Gentiles. He ended up becoming a defender and advocate of Christian faith. And he wrote 13 letters presented in the New Testament. Um, Romans, Galatians, Colossians. Um, let me do it the other way. Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. 1st Timothy, 2nd Timothy, Titus, and Philemon. Okay. He had three great missionary journeys all outlined in Acts. Okay. He spent two years in house arrest in Rome. And we'll learn more about that um, at the very last lesson um, in the quarter. And then... Um, it's believed that he was beheaded about um, 67 AD during Nero's reign. Now, Caesar, this is Caesar Nero. Okay, and remember, Caesar is a title. And so he was notorious. They thought he was mad or crazy. Okay, and they said that he fiddled, you know, words said that he fiddled while Rome burned, but it also says that he did burn down Jerusalem and he actually used Christians as torches as torches he lit them up you know now we need an outline leading to um paul's appearance before festus and king agrippa so this is gonna again for those who are listening i know i've got it written down but i know some people just listen um, I just need to take you through what happened. And I'm connecting it to the other lessons we had. Remember, we were talking about Stephen and Philip. Well, if you remember in Acts 8 1, that's right when the church spread, okay? Um, Saul was there and he consented, he consented to the stoning of Stephen. That's Acts 8 1. And then he became a persecutor of the way. Or we say he became a persecutor of the way. And that's what Christianity was called. Then on his way to Damascus, in order to persecute Christians, okay, I call it the Damascus Road experience. Most people probably do. Um, it was in the middle of the day when a bright light came. He fell off um, 
the donkey he was on, um, he ended up blind, okay? And he hears this voice saying, um, so, so why are you, you know, why are you um, persecuting me, okay? Um, and then he goes, who are you, Lord? Okay, and this is when Jesus commissioned Saul to witness and minister to the Gentiles. So this is Acts 26, 15b through 18, when um, Paul is describing what happened. And he says, and he said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting, but rise and stand on your feet, for I have appeared to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both for the things which you have seen and other things which I will yet reveal to you. I will deliver you from the Jewish people as well as from the Gentiles to whom I now send you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God that they may receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So this is what Jesus has said to Paul. And so um, Jesus commissioned Saul to witness and minister to the Gentiles. So after this Damascus Road experience, okay, he can't see, um, but God has Ananias come to deliver God's healing touch, okay? So even though Ananias touched him for him to receive his sight, remember, healing comes from God. So Ananias delivers God's healing touch and baptizes Saul. Then Saul immediately, he's filled with the Holy Spirit, he starts preaching Christ. Then Barnabas ends up bringing Saul to the apostles in Jerusalem. And then now he's received by the church and Paul goes on three missionary journeys. Because at the beginning, you know, um, after he was touched, um, baptized by Ananias, people weren't believing him at first, even though he was sharing the gospel because he knew the word, you know what I mean? Um, he knew the Old Testament. And so then Jesus had tied it all together for him. And so he realized that Jesus was Messiah. So at first, though, because he had been persecuting the church, so many people were like, is he legit or is he trying to trick us? Or, you know, and they were always kind of afraid. OK, but then Barnabas comes along um, and, and, you know, he's the encourager and he brings Saul to the apostles in Jerusalem. And now he's received fully by the church. And Paul goes on these three missionary journeys, which you can find in Acts. So now after the third mission, this is when trouble always was happening on the missionary journeys, but this is what sets us up for the lesson. So after the third missionary journey, he visits Jesus' brother James, okay, the leader of the Jerusalem church, okay, and he pays the fees of men taking a Nazarite vow. So then he's spotted in the temple by Jews who condemn him spreading the gospel. So he's in the, you know, he's in the temple. So then Paul is falsely accused of bringing a Gentile into the temple. And so he's arrested. So this is his arrest. The Jews do not want to hear his defense and the mob mentality heats up and, and they're trying to kill him, okay? And so then a Roman, a Roman tribune or higher rank than a centurion, okay? So a Roman commander, he protects Paul, but then flogs him. He starts beating him, okay? But then Paul tells him, Okay, it's a lot. So he's beating him. He protects him, but then he goes in and like, you know, you about to start a riot. And he starts to beat him. And then Paul tells him that he's a Roman citizen. Is he? And all of a sudden the Roman um, commander's like, uh-oh, because he's not supposed to do that to a Roman citizen. You know, and so then, you know, the commander goes, oh, you, you bought your citizenship? And then Paul says, no, I'm a Roman citizen by birth. So the beating stopped. Okay, the beating stop. Okay. And so then what happens is um, Paul states his case before the Sanhedrin, but there's big disagreement. Some who are okay with him talking, some not. So it's, they're not agreeing. So the Roman commander, he takes Paul back into protective custody because it's just a um, hotbed right now. Everything's crazy, mob mentality, um, people arguing, people wanting to kill Paul. So then, and, and that's what happens because Paul's, they don't kill him, but Paul's nephew comes and tells Paul. So he, his nephew is allowed to visit him in his protective custody. And Paul's nephew comes and tells Paul that 40 Jews have vowed. So they made a vow, you know, um, to murder him. So when the 
Roman commander, when the Roman commander finds out, um, he sends Paul accompanied by 200 soldiers to Felix. Here comes Felix, okay, in Caesarea. So this is the governor of Judea and he's in Caesarea. Now, Felix hears Paul's case once all the parties involved arrive. Because first he's like, well, I need the Jewish people to come. Oh, well, I need the Roman commander to come. I need to get all, get all the information. Okay. Now, um, so he hears the situation, but Felix, remember how he was described in my earlier thing. He was considered as base and licentious, you know, and just evil. Okay. Um, Felix leaves Paul in jail for two years. Because he's hoping Paul will bribe him. He was like, give me some money. I get you out of this. But Paul didn't bribe him. So Paul stays in jail or in house arrest or um, in custody um, for two years. And now Felix's term as governor is over. Okay. And so he's succeeded by Festus. And Paul is still in jail. Okay. Still arrested. So now Paul's case comes before Festus. So that's who we are. You know, when they said, remember, they consider Festus more fair than um, than Felix. But Festus really doesn't know a lot about um, Judaism um, and the Jewish law and Christianity and all that. He doesn't he doesn't know all that. Now, Festus, he's the new governor. And this sounds like, uh, again, stuff we're dealing with these days, people wanting political favor. So Festus wants political favor with the Jews. Okay, and the Jews will say, hey, bring Paul to Jerusalem. Um, and so they want him to come to Jerusalem because they plan, here we go again, to kill Paul along the way. You know, and Festus is about to let Paul, you know, make sure Paul gets to Jerusalem, but then Paul appeals to Caesar. And in um, the Roman judicial system, you have the right to appeal to Caesar. And also remember, Paul was a Roman citizen. And so he appealed to Caesar. So instead of Festus taking him to Jerusalem, he said, let me hear your case in Caesarea. And it does happen that King Agrippa II and Bernice come to visit Festus. And that's where this lesson starts. Whew. Okay. So all this background. So Jews got mad. They didn't like him preaching away. Um, and so then they falsely accused him of bringing a Gentile into the temple. And so by this time, um, we get to um, King Agrippa II and Bernice and Festus. Paul has been in jail for at least two years. Okay, at least two years. Okay, and been threatened in how many ways? You have 40 people trying to threaten him, mob mentality. Okay, they kept trying to kill him. Okay, so now we're to our lesson. Our lesson is Acts 16, 19 through 32. And as I read it, I'm just going to uh, talk about it because all that background gives us what's going on. So now King Agrippa says, talk to me, basically, okay? Um, because like I said, Festus didn't know a lot about Judaism and Christianity and everything. But um, remember King Agrippa II, his dad was King Agrippa I. He's been in this system for a long time. He, he, he knows what's going on, okay? Whether he agrees with it, but he knows what's going on. So he says, this is Paul talking. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. So he's talking about when Jesus commissioned him um, on the road to Damascus. But declare first to those in Damascus and in Jerusalem and throughout all the region of Judea and to the Gentiles that they should repent, turn to God and do works befitting repentance. So remember, once Paul had that um, experience with Jesus on the road to Damascus, once he, his eyes were opened and he was baptized, he started preaching the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. So he was, going, he was obeying Jesus, okay, what Jesus told him to do. He was obeying Jesus from that heavenly vision. So he started preaching um, immediately, like I said, in Damascus. They were expecting him to come and kill them, and then he starts preaching Christ. Then he ends up in Jerusalem, preaching Christ. Then he ends up um, throughout all the region of Judea, okay, preaching Christ. And then to the Gentiles, preaching Christ. And remember Acts 1-8, that they were supposed to go into the, all the world, you know. And so 
um, from Jerusalem, Samaria, um, where Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, and to the ends of the earth. Okay, that's Acts 1 8. And so it's the idea that here you see, once he was converted, okay, once he understood the truth that Jesus Christ was the way, the truth, and the life, he just started preaching the gospel, okay, the good news. And because he knew, remember, he knew um, the Torah, he knew what we would call the Pentateuch or the Old Testament or the Torah, okay, um, he was able to tie it together, you know, tie it together and show through um, what they studied that Jesus Christ was Messiah. And so here he was, so he's again telling them that they need to repent, which means turn from your sin, turn to God, okay, and do works befitting repentance, okay. And so then he says, for these reasons, the Jews seized me in the temple and tried to kill me. So it wasn't because, because what, what they accused him of was, you know, they, they accuse you of speaking against Rome. They accused him of speaking against the temple. They accused him of, um, of bringing a Gentile into um, the temple. They, you know, they accused him of um, speaking against Juda you know, um, Judaism. You know, they, they started accusing him of all kinds of stuff. He said, therefore, having obtained help from God, to this day I stand, witnessing both to small and great, saying no other things than those which the prophets and Moses said would come. So he says, I'm using the Torah, you know, the Pentateuch. I'm using that and, and saying what Moses and the prophets said that Messiah would come. He said, that's what I'm using. So I'm not speaking against what, what the law and Moses, you know, Moses and the law said. You know, he says, I'm showing you that it's fulfilled in Jesus Christ. You know, and then he says that the Christ would suffer that he would be the first to rise from the dead and would proclaim light to the Jewish people and to the Gentiles. You know what I mean? And so he said, that's what I'm doing. He says, I'm going from the, the Torah and I'm telling them you must be saved and that Jesus Christ is Messiah. He said, that's what I'm doing. So then here's where the issue when he said that jesus rose from the dead that's where the issue came up with a whole lot of people so now as thus he made his defense even though festus didn't know a lot festus said with a loud voice paul you are beside yourself much learning is driving you mad so they knew this was an intellectual but they said okay you that stuff has made you crazy you know you got a beautiful mind okay because now you're crazy you know what i mean that's what he's saying but also you have to remember that as he's telling this and he's talking to them about Jesus Christ and about repenting, remember Festus' situation, okay? Um, remember, you know, um, remember he was trying to get political favor with the Jews. So, you know, you got to remember his situation, okay? Um, but he's thinking, Paul, you're crazy. You know, you're talking about people rising from the dead, you know? But then Paul keeps going. He says, but he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus. And see how polite he is, you know, he says, most noble Festus, but speak the words of truth and reason. You know, our key verse says it as truth and soberness, you know, this is a seriousness, but of reason. For the king before whom I also speak freely knows these things. So then Paul turns the tables. So he's on trial, but then he goes and says, but King Agrippa, because remember, King Agrippa grew up knowing all, uh, knowing about because of his dad and his old family line. You know, they had been dealing with Judea for a long time. So he knows um, he might not know it, um, been right in the thick of it, but he actually, you know, heard about things that were going on. But he said he turns it around. So Paul turns this around and says, but King Agrippa, basically, he says, I, uh, I also speak these things freely and you know these things. So in other words, he builds him up. He says, you know these things, for I'm convinced that none of these things escapes his attention since this thing was not done in a corner. And so in other words, this wasn't, Jesus wasn't hiding in a corner. Everything that happened with Jesus' um, death and resurrection, that wasn't hidden, you know, um, the, the, the church starting, the way starting. He said, King Agrippa, you know, um, he says, I know you know these things. And then he turns it even more to King Agrippa. And he says, King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe. Because remember, King Agrippa was, he, he, he had been um, 
like I said, this king over Judea, okay, or king, he was king over Judea, but he was raised up in this system. And so he says, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do believe, you know. And, and, and then Paul is just saying, and all I'm doing is speaking what the prophet said. Okay. So then Agrippa said to Paul, you almost persuade me to become a Christian. That's what Agrippa says. You almost persuade me to become a Christian. And, you know, because he knows the truth, but, you know, the thing is with King Agrippa, if he knows the truth, he has to, what did he, what did Paul say they have to do? He has to repent. And remember, Agrippa is having a relationship with his half sister. Okay. So that means that's got to go. So then Agrippa says, you almost persuade me to become a Christian, you know, with his zeal, with his, with, um, with his testimony. Um, because of Christ, you know. Um, God sent his word and healed us and delivered us. And so just the word heals us and delivers us from the pit. And then Paul said, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me today might become both almost and altogether such as I am, except for these chains. So Paul is saying, I want everybody to be saved. And that's how we need to be. It doesn't matter. Um, the background, and if you look through Paul's missionary journeys, he talked to, as he said earlier, the small and the great. Here he's in the presence of government officials, but he's talked to jailers, okay? He's talked to um, <laughs> everybody, really, okay? And I can't even do the list. Y'all boys, we had a lot of lists today. But Paul talked to the small and to the great you know, in, in, in man's eyes, because he wanted all to be saved. And so what he's saying is, he said, I would to God that not only you, he says, I want you, he says, I want everyone um, who hears me today. So that would have been, there were soldiers there, there was um, Festus there, there was Bernice there. So he he's no respective persons, okay? So um, women, government officials, you know, men, uh, working class men, everybody. He says, I would that everybody, my all together, such as I am, understand and become a Christian. You know, he said, except for these change. I wish you were like me, except, you know, except for the fact that I'm in prison. He said, I don't, I don't wish this imprisonment on you. And then he says, when he has said these things, the king stood up as well as the governor and Bernice and those who sat with them. And so there was even extra people that he, he would want to be saved. And more people heard the good news of Jesus Christ, um, even those that aren't named here. And when they had gone aside, okay, so they went to say, well, we need to go and con have a conference and confer and see what's going on. When they had gone aside, they talked among themselves saying, this man is doing nothing deserving of death or chains. They realized that this man is doing nothing deserving of death or chains. Then Agrippa said to Festus, this man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. Okay, this man might have been set free if he had not appealed to Caesar. And we might be thinking, boy, he shouldn't have appealed to Caesar. But remember, if he had not appealed to Caesar, the Jews would have tried to kill him along the way back to Jerusalem when they just wanted to talk with him and Festus. So the idea is God had all these steps ordered that through all this, God protected Paul because Paul needed to go to Rome, because Paul needed to be a witness in Rome. He needed to be a witness in Rome. So the appeal had to take place for him because there's even more people in our lessons to come that Paul witnesses to, and they come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And so once Paul was persuaded, then it was with, then he kept persuading others to come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And or as he says, I'm just going back to the scripture where he says, to repent, to turn to God and do works befitting repentance. And so everyone, if you don't know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, 
it's time to repent. Repent means turn from sin, turn 180, we'd say, turn 180 degrees, okay? But turn from sin. And, and, and the whole thing is turn to God. And Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through Jesus Christ. So it says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's Romans 10, 9. Okay. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And I think a key word there is the Lord Jesus because we're not saved by works, but then you see, as Paul says, do works befitting repentance. So because then Jesus is Lord of our life and we follow him, we imitate him. And so my prayer for all who hear this, hear this Sunday school lesson is that you have, if you have not, that you turn from sin, turn to the truth, not your truth, not my truth the truth, Jesus Christ, turning by, and that's turning to God, and then live as Jesus being Lord of your life, doing works befitting repentance. To end this lesson, in summary, I'm going to give us 1 Peter 3, 13 through 16, and it says, and who will harm you if you are deeply committed to what is good? And I know, you know, Paul ends up this so many martyrs in the Bible, and Paul ends up one as well, but still, let's read further. It says, and who will harm you if you are deeply committed to what is good, but even if you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear or be disturbed, but honor the Messiah as Lord in your hearts. Always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. However, do this with gentleness and respect, keeping your conscience clear so that when you are accused, those who denounce your Christian life will be put to shame. This is the Holman Christian Standard Bible version of 1 Peter 3, 13 through 16. And again, the second part of verse 15, always be ready. And I'm going to throw in in season and out of season. Always be ready to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. We dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock we stand, all other ground is sinking sand. This is our lesson for this Sunday. Be blessed. Love in Christ, Sister Sharon.